All right. Good morning, everyone. Well, it seems I don't know what time it is. I'm thinking I'm still a little jet lagged right now. So, if you are here for to learn about change management as a Salesforce professional, you are in the right place. My name is Liz Hellinga. I am manager at uh, sales manager of operations at Silverline, and I'm also a Salesforce MVP. I'm really active in the WIC community. Um, I've spoken at Witness Success a couple times and at Dreamforce. Um, I'm really excited to bring this presentation to you about how admins are critical change agents within organizations because uh, I've had some experience with it um, and not awesome experience with it. So change is inevitable. Uh, we, all, we all have to experience change pretty much daily at some point in our career, but with Admins, we tend to sit at the center of change within our organization, and that's why, in addition to your rockin' technical skills as a Salesforce administrator, using change management skills will help you help your end users and your stake user, stakeholders hop along that change journey with you, because it truly is a journey, and it is inevitable, like everybody says, yet for some reason we are all so darn resistant. So before we dig into it today, I just want to settle on a, a definition for what is change management. And I pulled this from ProSci, which is one of the largest change management organizations in the world. Um, they have a certification. So if you're into certifications like I am, um, you can get certified from ProSci on change management. Um, I also hold a certification in change management from the Association of Talent Development, which is another organization that I'll reference throughout the presentation. But what is change management? It is the set of tools, resources, processes, skills, and principles for managing the people side of change to achieve the required outcome of the project or initiative. So it's all about the people. And I say this because just earlier this week at work, we were talking about making an update to how we forecast. Just adding one simple pickless value to how we forecast. Yet, yeah, very easy, right? I mean, how long do you think that would take um, in the setup to add that pick list value? 30 seconds, right? But the change side of it for our organization would take much longer. So we have to work through a communication plan. We have to figure out who needs to be told. We need to figure out how we should train them to make sure they know how to use it. So there's a lot more that goes into that simple addition of a pick list value than than we think when we want to enable the change effectively. And it's mainly dealing with the people, our end users. I'm also passionate about change management because I truly believe that it's combined with your amazing Salesforce skills. It's like a double whammy. You become, you know, elevated within your organization, you can build your career because you, you're thinking thoughtfully about how you enable change. You're not just clicking and adding a pick list value, you're not just adding a workflow, you're truly thinking about how your end users and your stakeholders can adopt that change effectively. So I like to say that change management skills and Salesforce skills go together like our favorite characters at a campfire. It's uh, They're having a party and they're having a great time. But I want to talk about how change management tends to have this negative connotation, right? And as administrators, we're not, we're not truly like managing the change, right? We're trying to enable the change. We're not like managing how people respond to it. We're, we're trying to enable them to be more effective, right? Because as a product owner of our instance within our organization, like we want to improve the business process, you want to improve things, and in order to do that, we have to enable the change. We want to help our stakeholders and our end users along on that journey. So I'm going to ask you all today to like take away the negative connotation of change management and think about you all are change enablers. So you are the change enablers within your organization. And it is a lot of responsibility. And I'm going to take you through some simple ways today that you can go back, even right after this session or even during this session, you can start to think about how you can take this back to your company, your nonprofit, your organization, and begin to enable change more effectively. 
So before we dig into this even more, um, I want to talk about the scale of change. Because a lot of times when we think about enabling change or including change management as part of a project, we think about it on the radical end of change. But there, change is a scale. Where we spend most of our time is probably on this lower half, incremental to the middle of that scale. Think radical change would be like, enabling sales or implementing Salesforce for the first time for an organization or implement, implementing maybe Workday or some other large enterprise solution. That's when you start to hear people talking about change management. But you really need to think about it on, on the lower end of the scale first. Because as you do that, you start to exercise that skill set so that when you are given that larger project, that radical change project, you'll already have some of the skill sets in place to make it an easier process for you and most importantly for your end users and stakeholders. So we're, we live more down here, um, but we will develop skill sets to get us more along the, to the radical side of change. And really, most of, I should say this too, most of the time, you know, this is where we are. We're not, we're not always in radical change. I hope not, because a lot of organizations can't take that type of change. But we are constantly evolving our instance more incrementally. <clears throat> when you start to use change management skills or change enablement skills, you begin to develop trust with your end users and stakeholders. And I will say that developing trust is probably one of the most important things that you can do as a Salesforce administrator. Because as change becomes more radical, as your projects become bigger and wider for your instance, the need to build trust increases. So while yes, I probably could have flipped the switch on adding that additional forecast category on Monday before I came out here to London, um, I knew that if I did without enabling that change within our organization, that it would either cause a bit of chaos and pain or um, People just wouldn't adopt it. So you have to think through some of those things before you do that. But it builds trust with your organization. Your stakeholders, the people that are coming to you to enable change, will trust you and know that when they're asking you to make changes to the Salesforce instance to improve how you use it, um, that you will be thinking through about how to effectively enable it. So there's five ways today that you can start to enable effective change within your organization. And it's number one, starting with understanding the why. I don't know how many of you have seen Simon Sinek's um, The Power of Why. So the why is everywhere. We, we as admins need to embrace it. Obviously planning is important for change enablement. A lot of times when you see like project plans, right, like you get this big project plan and you can manage all the technical parts of it very well, but if you do not include change management as a part of it, it will not be successful. So I'll give you some things to help you even set guide templates for you for planning so you can use that going forward. The stakeholders, right? That's the people part of change, and it is the most important. We're going to spend some time talking through the stakeholders and how you can find them, um, because they are everywhere. Uh, communication, which is probably another big component of, well, it is a big component of change enablement. And then empathy and listening. Empathy goes a long way when you're trying to get people to adopt new things within Salesforce and new procedures and new processes. So understanding the why. Whenever we make change, we need to understand what is the business case? What is the compelling reason why we need to change? How many of you have ever experienced change within your organization and you went to ask somebody, why are we doing this? And their response to you was, well, because the VP wants it or the CEO wants it. And how many know how unsatisfying it is to hear that, <laughs> right? It's not fun when, you, when somebody says, well, because so-and-so said so, then you automatically become resistant, or at least the rebelliousness in me becomes resistant. So as, as a Salesforce administrator or as a Salesforce professional, you need to understand like, specifically what is happening. And I suggest like, just having one to two sentences at the ready 
of why you are enabling that change. Because inevitably, you'll be getting a cup of coffee in the break room or running into somebody in the hallway or even on a Zoom meet, virtual meeting, and they're going to be like, well, why are we doing this? And you need to be able to explain the business reason about why you're doing that. They may not still like it, <laughs> but at least it's better than saying, like, well, because so-and-so wants it, and so-and-so wants me to do that. So having one to two sentences about that change is really helpful. Um, and so I create little project sheets, and I will craft a couple sentences for myself just to reference back to it whenever I'm doing something. The other reason I want to highlight, and throughout this, you'll see that I'll highlight um, these, I'll have these little, like, uh, road signs for key business skills because outside of just change management enabling change within your organization having the ability to develop business cases is crucial as an administrator and I'll, within my when I was um, a solo admin how many of you are solo admins when I was in my first solo admin job like in 2014 Within the first month of being in that role, I had to craft a business case for our CEO on why we should upgrade to enterprise because we were unprofessional. I was like, well, I can't do any cool stuff in Salesforce. If we're, but he didn't get that, obviously, <laughs> like you all would. But I had to develop a business case. And I'm going to share some components with you on the next slide. And these slides will, become a, will be made available to all of you. But um, just key things to think through, so then it, you can summarize and craft those one to two sentences quite easily for when you're passing somebody in the hallway and they're complaining about something that you're putting in to Salesforce. Oh, oh dear, where did they go? Ah, the slide is gone. Um, maybe I suppressed it. Well, there's a, um, shoot, well, I'm going to take you through them. So there's a couple of key components. The first thing that you need whenever you're um, building out a business case is data. So what are the data points that you need to support your business case? So for example, let's say that your customer response time grew, it doubled to 24 hours from 12 hours. That is an alarming data point, right? So as part of a business case, it's like, yes, we need to explore this problem because we've gone from 24 hour response time to um, 12 hours. So you need to have the data to support that. Secondly, you need to understand like what needs to change, like how, um, what journey are we gonna go on to improve that process? and be able to explain that within your business case, like what we need to do in order to reduce that, those response times. And then once you get through that, you, so you have you know, the data to support the change, the reasons why, another key component that you need to have in all business cases is the status, what, what if you just do the status quo? Right? What happens if you just say, it's fine, we're just gonna stay here. Like, what is the organization or what is that department, what are those individuals going to lose out on if you decide to just maintain the status quo? Which is never fun, but you need to give people that exp explanation. And then sec lastly, uh, if you could say, oh great, I'm gonna get this, the response time back to 12 hours, that's okay, but like, if I'm gonna go through the process of like improving something and making it better. I want to get like better than I want to do better than 12 hours. I would say I'm going to make it six hours because we're going to add these cool workflows and these notifications. And then our customers are no longer going to be waiting 24 hours. They're now going to be only waiting six hours for this to be resolved. So give, painting that picture is what you can do in um, developing business cases. How many of you have developed business cases in your roles? I was kind of shocked as a solo admin about how much I had to do it. And I probably developed business cases at least one to two times a month for leadership. So planning. Developing a repeatable plan is important. Uh, we, like I mentioned before, when you're thinking about project management, and you're, you're, plan, you're doing work breakdown structures and you're getting into you know, details of who's doing what, sometimes we leave out the fact that we need to have a plan for change enablement and change management. So think about like what are the goals of the change in the description. So the business case becomes very helpful for this. So you keep building upon what you're doing. 
you want to paint the picture of what success will look like. So document that. Have it in your plan. Like what will it, what will we expect to achieve once we adopt this change? What does success look like? Have a very clear vision in your plan. It, it, kudos if you can even tie it to one of like your your business vision or your business objectives. So every year at Silverline, we go through, um, what we, it's like an OKR process where we set up objectives and key results for the entire organization, filters all the way down to my, my specific role. If I can tie that, um, that change or that project back to it, it's even more powerful for the organization and for adoption. So thinking through that when you're planning, developing a list of stakeholders, and I'm gonna talk more about stakeholders because we need to, <laughs> but um, you probably develop a stakeholder list when you're working on projects and you may be thinking about like who needs to be informed and what, what they need to do or who's responsible for what, but taking it even a step further um, with how you have to communicate with them. So having a communication plan. And, there's, and you can scale this plan based on how radical the change is, right? There's certain things that you need to do incrementally that you need to let people know and con you know but there's also stuff that you'll need to do on that may be different and more detailed for radical change so build a template first for yourself and then obviously it'll evolve depending on the type of project that you're working on so stakeholders stakeholders are very interesting to me because it's like I think it's like a psychology thing that I enjoy thinking about them um, and have any of you ever read, or anybody have a copy of the PMBOK Guide, the Project Management Institute? It's this giant book about project management. Well, they define stakeholders as anybody that has a perceived interest in your project. I perceived is like the interesting word because sometimes, have you ever made a change in your Salesforce instance and all of a sudden somebody comes up to you that you had no idea would care about that change you made and they are like super angry. Yeah, the angry end user. Change management can help with that, but it's, be it's because they were a stakeholder that you didn't know about. And it's hard to find them. It's, they pop out, or out of nowhere. But one easy way to help you start to map out um, who the stakeholders are would be to think through the process and anybody who touches that process. So if you're thinking about, let's say you want to modify something on the opportunity object, already I could think of like, you know, four or five groups of people that would need to be involved, right? So we got the salespeople because they care about it, tell inside sales, and we want marketing, sales leadership, C-suite, we probably can add another five more. So start to think through like who touches each part of the process and then take it even a step further and think about or ask them, like, who else should care about this? Like, who else would care if I add this new pick list value to the forecast field, right? Maybe your investors will care about it, depending on what dashboards that field um, filters up to. So those are things to consider. Um, and really try not to leave any rock unturned when looking for them. It's the best way to avoid that um, unexpected angry end user. Because you don't, so I've had, I've made changes where somebody's executive assistant called me up and was like, I use this report for this SVP. And I'm like, oh no, I need to figure out how to put that back. <laughs> it's <laughs> because you know that they're complaining about you <laughs> to that SVP. So think through it. One recommendation I have, and because right, I just rattled off like five people that care about the opportunity object. Make a standard list by object of who would care about it and who would need to be notified if you were going to consider making changes to it. When I do my project sheets, I list, I create a stakeholder list and then I'll even reach out to those individuals and say, who else should be involved? But I have a standard list of who I kind of always know. We may know it in the back of our mind, but if, as your team starts to grow or as you have other people that help manage the Salesforce instance with you, it's great to have that is a resource for them, especially for newbies. It makes their onboarding so much easier because they automatically know who to go to right away and to ask questions about what changes we're gonna make. 
The other thing I recommend too is, um, I, how many of your instances have custom objects? Yeah, almost all of us, right? <laughs> and we have custom objects that we may have created a couple years ago, right? And it's hard to sometimes remember exactly who was involved in making that custom object. So if you are documenting your org well, you probably have a list of people that were involved in the creation of that custom object. Just keep that somewhere so that you can go back and reference it. So at any time somebody wants to make a change maybe to that custom object, you know right away who you need to reach out to, or your future, well, your future self will thank you for it, and so that you don't have to go through and be like, who cares about this object that I made about lunch on Wednesdays, or something like that. Um, it's very helpful. <clears throat> the other thing that I highlight about stakeholders, because they can be super annoying, is that they are also great ways to grow your network. So one of the ways that I help myself deal with sometimes the ornery stakeholders or end users is that they are tremendous ways to grow your network. <laughs> if you are somewhat um, you know, introverted or, you, or, you're, or you're remote, like you, stakeholders are a great way to just start to build connections within your company and for your career. And I'll give you an example. When I had my first solo admin role, they wanted me to completely redo the sales process and reconfigure it globally. And so I'm like, all right, I got to do that within the first 90 days of taking on this role. And it was, it was quite an undertaking um, to change the sales process for about 60 salespeople um, within 90 days. But what it, I spent a lot of time thinking through like who the stakeholders were and like how to enable that change effectively. And it eventually led me to get some other projects within the company that I wouldn't normally have gotten. Like they may have, um, our CMO, our chief marketing officer, reached out to me after we had deployed the sales process and said, look, you know, I need to do marketing automation. Uh, can you lead the project? Normally, you'd have somebody in the marketing department lead it, but because I had helped him and everybody adopt it so successfully, they, he reached out to me to lead it. And I think that I, to this day, I still think that's the reason why I got a promotion at that organization within a year was because I had managed the stakeholders well and used them to grow my internal network and my internal brand by using change management skills. Um, but it's not easy, but it's, but it's, I just, you don't know like who in your stakeholder pool could be the person opening the next door for you. And I think it's easier to work with it that way and build your brand and your recognition on projects and enabling those changes effectively that I guarantee somebody will be like, oh, tap them on the shoulder to see if they can help with this project. So spend as much time as you can cultivating those relationships with the stakeholders. Communication. Whew. We are born communicating, right? Screaming, crying. But yet it is something that we still continue to struggle with. But it is one of the biggest components of change enablement is communication. So once you get that list of stakeholders, figuring out how to effectively communicate this change to them, how to get them on board, how to get them to adopt this so that we ultimately can get the data and reporting that we need to make effective business decisions. Consider, so take that stakeholder list for that change, put it in a Google Sheet or Excel, whatever you'd like to use, and start to figure out how they need to be informed. Do they just need to be aware of it? Just, they just need to be told, hey, we're making this change. Do they need to be supported through it? So if you think about my example about changing the forecast category, the people that need to be supported through it would be our sales team, right? They need to be the ones that are making, updating their forecast. But the awareness probably needs to be more on a higher level. And then who needs to be involved? Some people need to be involved in the change. You can't make decisions about that change without them. So look at those stakeholders and consider who needs to be involved, who can just be told this is what's going on, or who needs to be supported so that they can accept the change. And I guarantee that if you just do that thing, that one thing with allocating to the stakeholders, that your adoption of change will be improved significantly. Think about what needs to be communicated. 
Sometimes you can over communicate. Uh, we, we get like those four paragraph emails. Um, sometimes you're like, what am I, what do I really need to care about in this four paragraph email? But consider what particularly needs to be communicated to each of those stakeholder groups. Consider the method for communication. Right now, like uh, we could get, we're getting communicated to in a bazillion different ways, right? I mean, I have Slack, email, chatter, um, phone co conference calls, meetings, emails, what I mean, even I have people that text me, send me stuff on Twitter. We're getting constantly communicated to in various methods and it can be, it can be overwhelming. So you have to consider what is the most effective method for getting that communication across. Depending on the size of your project and the duration, you need to consider when and how often. When you're introducing that project or that change to your stakeholders, I would ask them how often they want to be communicated to. Tr try to follow it, right? Some people be like, oh, just tell me when it's done. Sure, right. <laughs> We've all had that, right? Where they'd be like, yeah, just tell me when it's all up and done. And then you, you finally roll it out. And they're like, wait, wait, you didn't consult me on this. Um, this is, takes a little bit of finesse to know um, that maybe when they say something, they don't really mean it. So tend to err on a little bit of over-communication, at least at the beginning, until you start to understand what your stakeholders prefer. And that you're not, it's not always going to be perfect. I still make mistakes with it. And another thing to consider is when or, or who should do the communicating. Sometimes you may have a super user that's like all gung-ho about a change that you're going to push through. I would consider maybe having them do some of the communication because maybe their peers will t take to it more likely if the, the super user or the power user is um, talking about how excited they are for the change. I mean, definitely you that's implementing the change can talk about it, but I mean, I would try to see if there's other people that you can get on the bandwagon to do the communication, you know, other stakeholders. Uh, you know, as a last resort, maybe sometimes you need to go to like the C-suite, depending on the scale of the change. But I think sometimes if you hear it from your peers, you are a little bit more inclined to be more open to adapting the change. Um, maybe use the higher ups when you need to. Uh, maybe on large scale change, like at least having a general message, but then having other people um, helping you communicate it. But from a key business skill perspective, communication skills are like the top soft skill that companies are looking for. So if you practice this a little bit and improve it, I guarantee people will take notice within your organization and beyond. One of the things, um, like just being here for today, me presenting to you is an exercise in me improving my communication skills. Um, I recommend that everyone takes an opportunity to do that. I, I mean, when I, prior to becoming an administrator, I was a salesperson. And I thought when I became an administrator that I would be able to give up PowerPoint, give up presentations. I really did. I was like, oh, I'm done with that. I don't have to, I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> like I'm not great at building beautiful slides. <laughs> um, but lo and behold, I spent quite a bit of time putting together Google slide decks to communicate change within our company. So it doesn't go away, unfortunately, as much as I still would love it to. So I push myself to continue to do that. But, and I recommend that you all do the same because if you can communicate effectively, that is it's a soft skill that just isn't easy to just grow employees. You can't like you can sure you can send them to a presentation skills class or you can send them to a business writing class, but it takes a lot of effort and practice to improve communication skills. So I recommend, you know, even taking some of the trails on Trailhead, like the writing or the storytelling one, will improve your communication skills. And people will take notice for sure. So empathy and listening are truly important when it comes to getting users to adapt change. <coughs> a little empathy goes a very long way. And listening, obviously, listening skills are number one. 
because change is never easy. We're all resistant to it. Even if it's your best friend telling you about something that is gonna change and your, your initial reaction, the initial human reaction is always a tad negative at first, a tad resistant. Um, so having empath empathy and Im improved listening skills will help with the adoption of change. I always say click a mile in their shoes. How many are familiar with Mike Gerholt? Uh, he is the admin evangelist. He says SABWA, Salesforce Administration by Walking Around. That goes so far in building up your trust equity within your organization. So your end users, your stakeholders will definitely build a stronger rapport with you and be more likely to go on that change journey with you if they are able to, if you are spending time with them. And I'm, how many of you work remote? Oh good, so a lot of you, so you have no excuse. If you're in the office, you could do the SABWA. But I work remote, so I have to schedule Zoom meetings with people to sort of get feedback. And so I have like, like I mean, we have a lot of salespeople, so at least like once a quarter, I try to have conversations with them individually to, uh, to make sure, thank you goes by so fast <laughs> to make sure that um, th we have this open communication and I can start to build that rapport and trust because it will go a long way. And also having them show you what is going on, not just telling you, will give you so much more insight when you have to sit, like we had made some changes to sales path. I never sat and watched a salesperson do it after we made the changes, and I was like, oh, wow, that is so frustrating. I realized after the fact, and I thought, gosh, if I would have spent more time with them on the front end before we implemented this change, I would, we would have avoided some of those frustrations. So it's constantly evolving. So having them show you, not tell you, clicking a mile in their shoes will go a long way. But there's also scientific stuff that supports why you should have empathy and listening with your users when you're going on the change journey. Because it truly, this truly is a journey. This comes from um, the, from the American, uh, not American, the uh, Association for Talent Development. Most of us want to spend our time here. We are all there. We are all in our comfort, control. We're very excited. We're doing our thing every day. We're, you know, like, don't, don't mess with my process. That's where we all live. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes out, and they're like, we are going to make some change. And this is where they go. They go here to this fear, maybe, hopefully not anger, but some people do. Definitely resistance, right? There's a lot of resistance when you're going through it. So this, this will happen when you start to introduce change. Eventually, they move through the chaos and they get into the inquiry experimentation. Maybe they're doing some stuff hands-on in the sandbox for you to test it. Or they're starting to be like, oh, okay, I'm seeing how this uses, works. I'm getting some benefit out of it. And then they'll move up to the learning, acceptance, and commitment. And then eventually back to their warm, soft blanket of comfort and control. The goal is when you're using change enablement skills and you have empathy and you have listening and you have good communication and you know your stakeholders and you can communicate the why, the path for them to go through this cycle is smoother because you're building trust with them and you're helping to maybe, maybe this little quadrant is a little bit shorter than the next, the last time. And as you start to keep using those skills, you continue to push them through this cycle more smoothly, less bumps, less headaches for you as an administrator, and ultimately more adoption of the business um, initiatives that you're pushing through for your organization, and ultimately, hopefully, like a lot of success, right? So applying that and having empathy and your listening skills truly will move them through this, but you're, you will have to you will have to listen to them sometimes, and that can be frustrating, so you just have to take a deep breath, let them sort of vent some of their anger out <laughs> or resistance, and then try to get them into the part where they're experimenting and they're sort of discovering the changes that you're pushing through. So thank you all so much for meeting with me today to learn about change enablement skills. There, is, there are loads of ways that you can continue to learn about how to effectively manage change within your company. 
There's obviously a trail. So the, um, if you do the Drucker School Organizational Change Leadership Trail, we'll um, have some handy resources in there. There's also online learning platforms that have courses in um, change and management, like Coursera, Udemy. If you are like me and love certifications, I mean, how many of you are certified in here? Yeah, if you love certifications, you can get ProSci or the ATD one, which I have. Um, and then just commit to focusing on these five best practices. I mean, if you write down a stakeholder list during lunch, I guarantee it will give you a different perspective on some of the changes that you're going to deploy. Are there any questions? Could you just pull up the five best practices again? Oh, yeah. Oh, we'll go all the way back to the beginning, right? <laughs> Thank you. So these are the five ways that you can enable change. So understanding the why. I didn't embed Simon Sinek's uh, video in here, but you could just Google it and you'll find it. Think about planning, stakeholders, communication, empathy, and listening. And I, once you start to do this, what is also amazing is that the people that work with you will come to expect it from you. So you may experience some resistance when you're putting people through their paces of finding who the stakeholders are or thinking about how to communicate. But I, in three months, four months, people will just start to expect that from you and maybe bring you the list of stakeholders and their preferred communication methods. Are there any other questions? Excellent. Thank you so much for spending time with me this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you.